My name is Joe Vitri. Joe Forcina. My name is Doug Moore. I'm John Vickers. I'm Joe Seabode. My uh, name is Roselle Hen Stern. This is Carl Van Florky. I was captain of the Dredge McFarland in 2001. My name is John Perbilla. My name is Dave Leach. I'm currently uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. My name is Mickey Mulvena. My name is Colonel David Wong. 20 years ago, I worked at New York District, and I was the Environmental um, Analysis Section Chief. 20 years ago, I was the Chief of Emergency Management in the Army Corps of Engineers, Philadelphia District. 20 years ago, I was uh, chief of the survey section for the Philadelphia District Corps of Engineers. During 9-11, well, I was a captain of the Army Corps of Engineers as an mo individual mobilization augmentee. I was the network administrator for Philadelphia and I was also an SME for North Atlantic Division. When the 9-11 occurred, I was the deputy district engineer at the Philadelphia District. 20 years ago, I was the Area Engineer for Metropolitan New York, uh, Army Corps of Engineers. 20 years ago, boy, we're going back now. So 20 years ago, I was actually the Assistant Chief of Planning in the New York District, right there in Manhattan, a few blocks away from Twin Towers. Um, the day 9-11 uh, was really a beautiful day and I had commuted in early before the meeting that was supposed to be held with the Port Authority. My whole recollection of everything with 9-11 sort of started the day before 9-11 and on September 10th, it, you know, like the 11th, they were just two beautiful fall days in, uh, you know, early fall days in, in New York City. Crisp, clear skies, not a cloud in the, you know, up there. and. It weathered just perfect, and we were actually doing a helicopter inspection of the, uh, many of our projects with Senator Schumer. And uh, we were leaving and returning to the heliport at, at, at Wall Street, uh, which is right down there by uh, sort of on the east side by the towers. And uh, as we were coming in that night, uh, later, much later in the evening, he, it was a beautiful sunset and we both remarked that, look at this view of lower Manhattan and how, you know, how striking it is and just the Statue of Liberty, the towers, everything. And, and so it was interesting because that was sort of the last view I ever had of that particular skyline. I was on the 18th floor of uh, 26 Federal Plaza in my office, uh, having a discussion with another uh, project manager and I heard this sound, uh, which sounded strange, but, you know, just shook it off, basically. And as I came to learn later, that was the first plane impacting uh, the World Trade Center. We went outside onto the dock, and we looked across the river, and the one building was on fire. And like I, I said at the time to my friends, I said, I have friends who are firemen in New York City. They're going to get that fire out and that building's gonna be half occupied tomorrow. I thought it was no big deal. So we went back into the classroom and then there was an unbelievable roar over the top of the building. It, it, it felt like a plane was gonna land on the building. And somebody outside we heard yelling, there's another one, there's another one. And by the time we got outside, it had hit the second building. But that one hit lower, you know, the first one was way up high and the second one was lower. So then we were thinking, there's something's going on here, there's a problem. That day was pretty much standard day. We were sitting in the office uh, doing the stuff. I worked in the office, I didn't work in the field then, I was an office guy. And as everybody else, we were following the news on, uh, on the radio and the TV. And I believe there was a TV in HR then, Human Resources, I guess it's still called Human Resources. And uh, we were astonished at the first plane and the second plane and it was, just total devastation in everybody's mind to try to figure out what was going on. I was on my way to a meeting at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey on the 72nd floor of One World Trade Center. It's amazing as I look back on it that the night before that early morning meeting on Tuesday, September 11th, I received a phone call that asked me if we could push the meeting back a half hour from 9 to 9.30. And I agreed to that and then decided to come straight to the World Trade for the meeting in the morning. 
Uh, I, was, I was on my way up to that meeting when the, when the planes hit, and I was fortunate that I was in a location where I could escape the building on the uh, northern side, and uh, that's what I did. I ran out after the plane had hit the building and was fortunate. They'd moved the meeting from the World Trade Center to another location in Union Square because this tr the uh, Port Authority didn't have a room large enough for all of us uh, at that day. Um, however, many people didn't really know that nuance and thought we were all in the World Trade Center. So um, my supervisors, um, my husband, they all thought we were in the tower when the the tragedy occurred. I myself was on the street, Church Street, um, and I saw the first plane go right by in front of my eyes. I rounded the corner and saw it impact uh, the first tower. I was very, very upset um, thinking about not only my colleagues in the World Trade Center, um, but also my husband. So we got on, on all the boats that were there. You know, there was, um, uh, there was, uh, you know, all the boats that the, the, they had at Cape and Point, debris boats and things like that. And we, we started to head over towards Manhattan. And this part gets me very emotional is that, you know, everybody, like they left their egos on the dock. And everybody said, like, okay, hey, what are we going to do? So nobody said, like, well, I, I run a bigger ship than you. I should be in charge. Everybody just said, like, what can you do? And we said, well, what if we find somebody who's hurt? What are we going to do? And one guy said, look, I just took a, a two-week medical course. Okay, if you get anybody that's hurt, you bring them to this guy. What do we do if there's some a body in the water? We said, if a person's alive in the water, We'll pick them up. And the one guy said, I have no problem jumping in the water. Okay, you'll be the guy that goes in the water. If there was a body that was dead, we wouldn't take the time to pick them up, but we would definitely try to avoid them with, with the vessel. We, one day we broke down here and our, the, the initial forward deployment site was Camp Kilmer in New Brunswick, New Jersey. So we broke everything down here. The next day, packed all up in a van, went to Camp Kilmer, stood it all up there, and within a day or so of being there, they, um, I guess FEMA made its forward uh, location, uh, Pier 90 up in New York, uh, Manhattan. So we broke everything down and then you know, things were crazy. Then uh, um, everybody's still exiting New York City. Um, um, ground transportation was almost impossible to get in and out of the city easily. So the easiest way to go was by a, we have boat to get up to Pier 90. So what we did is uh, myself and our uh, IT chief at the time, we drove up, I believe it was on the 15th was the first day we went to Manhattan. And we drove up to New York District Field Site in Caven Point, New Jersey, and got on a tugboat. And uh, we went up the Hudson to get up to Pier 90. And uh, to me, uh, this is what my the, you know, the strongest recollection I have from uh, the whole response to 9-11 was this, the sun, there still was another beautiful clear day, and the sun was coming up on the Hudson, we're on the, the tugboat going up the Hudson, and we pass um, the Twin Towers, and there's still to see the skeleton and the wreckage of it uh, still smoldering coming up, and the sun coming up on the river. It was so surreal at the time, and I still will never forget that. I deployed to Ground Zero, uh, myself and three other surveyors. We were actually deployed on the south side of the South Tower, right at Ground Zero, uh, for the, the duration of our stay. We were, we were deployed from Port Mifflin, took our survey gear, drove to Caven Point at uh, New York District on the Jersey side in Bayonne, took a boat over to the island uh, in Manhattan, and then walked to Ground Zero. Within a mere 24 hours, uh, I was able to get back to the site of the World Trade Center as a representative of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and to start assisting with the uh, response and rescue and recovery operations. 
Uh, within a few days, the chief of engineers asked if I'd serve as the liaison to the city of New York for the response, to which I absolutely agreed immediately. And uh, I set off working with all of our local, state, and federal partners uh, to effectuate, as best we could, the rescue and recovery operations. And quite frankly, it was an incredible effort by many, many individuals, many agencies, uh, and I was proud to be a part of it because I think in the end, the human spirit was, was significant and we did great work um, on behalf of all involved, including being very respectful and uh, dutiful in our, our methods and our operations to those who perished that day. We ended up um, supporting FEMA for debris monitoring uh, on site. Um, at the time, New York City had determined that they were going to do the recovery, the debris, and everything else via their contractors and whatnot. It was a very personal matter for them, and that's okay. Um, so we provided support to FEMA directly in the debris monitoring, just on-site uh, equipment checks, what's working, what's not, um, safety. We had no authority per se, but just take notes, kind of the eyes and ears on the ground for FEMA. and. Um, uh, we, just overall, just walking around the areas, uh, how debris was, uh, operations were going in general, making notes, and uh, reporting back to FEMA. So, I remember a couple of things when we were pushed in there, taking on people. I remember a little boy getting on board, and I said, how are you doing, buddy? And he said, I'm really scared. <laughs> So I said to him, that's all right. I'm really scared too. To some kid, won a baseball hat with his parents, probably going to the Statue of Liberty. You know, it was interesting because uh, the first day when I went down there and I got my badges and everything, they, they had set up a temporary uh, field office over on the uh, on the uh, west side, over on the piers, the old uh, passenger ship terminal, they set up a field office in there. And I show up in there and it's just like a hubbub of activity. There's thousands of people uh, running around. There's FEMA people, there's city people, there's just cops and firemen. It's just pure chaos. And um, so I get in there, I get all, you know, all the different ne necessary badges. You had to have different badges every day. They were changed. They had different color codes on them that allowed you to go to different, different parts of the uh, site. Um, because of the job that I was yet to find out about, I got this badge that allowed me to go right down to the very heart of, of Ground Zero. And I was looking at it because I was looking at the color codes and I, again, I still don't really even know what my, my role is going to be. So I got pulled aside by um, some leadership uh, from the Corps who actually had flown in and um, they said, you know, we understand you, you know, you have a good relationship, again, with a lot of the members. We'd like you to help with facilitating congressional uh, visits and dignitary visits down to Ground Zero, hence the reason for the badge that I had. Um, you know, and by that point, I'm thinking to myself, well, what am I going to do, be a tour guide? I was like a little bit sort of miffed about it. I thought I, you know, would want to get in there and start doing some of the work that we've been trained for, debris removal, et cetera. And then all of a sudden something clicked in my head and I realized I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in the Bronx. And I said, you know what? This is a story that needs to be told. And it needs to be told to the people who have the ability to influence a particular outcome. And those people are those very dignitary, those members of Congress, the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. And so for the next, uh, well, many months, that's basically what I did. I took uh, high level dignitaries all the way up up to the White House, uh, down to Ground Zero. I walked them around. I explained to them a lot about what was going on and sort of the operations that were taking place, the role of the Corps, FEMA, and others that were in there. So on the following day, on September 12th, we were preparing to get ready to receive any USACE responders, because at the time we had structural engineers, surveyors, other support staff that would need to come in. So basically, we would be the logistics support to, mo to making sure that people are ready coming in from Army Corps engineers to go down to support to Ground Zero. Later that day, General Flowers, who was the chief engineers at the time, made me the senior civilian for the response, so I was the, incident, the civilian incident commander. So I was a project manager working on the harbor deepening, 
And I wanted to help in any way. And I remember calling the colonel at the time, was Colonel O'Dowd, and I was sent to work at, as an action officer at Pier 84 on the west side. And it was a, basically all sorts of federal agencies were operating out of those areas. Uh, FEMA, you know, whatever, the Corps of Engineers. And my responsibility at that time was to keep track of all the individuals that we were bringing in throughout the Corps, okay, whether it was search and rescue, whether it was thermal imaging folks, because if you may recall, there was a tremendous fire going on, okay, I mean, really hot fire. And what we had wanted to do, at least one of the things that the Corps was attempting to do, was to map to see where potentially we may have a possibility of some survivors and where the hot spots were. Uh, we also had uh, you know, search and rescue folks going in to see the stability of the structure, see where there may be a potential signs of life for, for, re for rescue versus you know, what it turned out to be later, recovery. So I was tracking all those individuals, also going down to the pit itself and ensuring that the construction workers, whoever was there was wearing proper gear because right, that became a big deal as far as trying to force people to keep those masks on because we didn't know what was uh, emanating from that site. Our role was to monitor the remains of the high steel that was left from the towers and the steel that was embedded in the adjacent structures and to monitor those with surveying instruments while the rescue workers, we pretty much arrived there five days after the Tuesday that it happened. So we were pretty much at the rescue the, and recovery stages. So our job was to make sure the steel was not moving above the rescue workers, and if it was, to, to uh, give the information to the rescue workers that a piece of steel over X location was moving so they could be aware of it. So uh, we were there to um, support Region 3 uh, and to assume any missions that the Corps of Engineers might have. Um, I believe I was there maybe four or five days, and then I came back to the Philadelphia District serving as chief and overseeing the um, logistical operations and what eventually morphed to um, Pier 90 in New York to support our incoming um, you know, responders. We initially set up a, a uh, disposal transfer station right in lower Manhattan uh, to receive barges as they took material off of uh, the debris pile. That was the, actually the initial effort that we participated in. And we were subsequently um, re requested through FEMA, through the emergency response ESF uh, protocols to uh, set up the, uh, what I call the recovery operation up at Staten Island. Our mission varied. For example, um, we were runners, whatever needed to be done. John, we need air horns for this urban search and rescue crews because they needed to say all stop, listen for noise, listen, or binoculars because they needed to look up at the buildings around us. For example, the, uh, the Verizon building had this huge beam skewered through it we didn't know whether these things were going to come down on people, so you needed the combination of the, vi the vision and the air horns to announce all stop or seek shelter. Uh, what I did was a lot of sit reps uh, for the management team. When the team did arrive in New York City, they could not communicate with headquarters. So I did, for the first two weeks, a lot of relaying information from on-site at Ground Zero to um, Headquarters UOC and then return the information back to the DTOS units. Uh, but otherwise I was keeping an eye on the rest of the units, keeping the program running while our the rest of the management team was up in New York handling the, the response there. I went home. It was my birthday that weekend. And, uh, and then I came back um, a couple of days later and I came into Cabin Point and they had, uh, you know, they needed help. Uh, they wanted to run their boats 24 hours a day. So we filled in the gaps for them so that they could run the boats 24 hours a day. And, you know, we were doing different jobs of moving people across the river and 
uh, you know, equipment and stuff like that. And I stayed there for about a week. Um, I worked on some of the environmental um, uh, clearances needed for dredging to allow barges to come in closer to the um, uh, towers to remove the debris and take it to um, Fresh Kills in Staten Island where it was sorted and processed. And apparently now they've turned that debris into a Navy battleship. I just saw yesterday in the news. So um, that's, that's really my involvement with 9-11 and I uh, worked with many colleagues who were much more uh, involved with uh, the actual site and, and, the, and the recovery and, and the work that went on there and we all supported each other as a team which is something the Corps of Engineers does very well um, because it took a toll on all of us um, just knowing what we were doing and, and what had happened. When I started assisting the commander from New England district as his operations officer, we basically established a, a task force uh, working out of the disaster field office. We literally went through every, every, I'm going to say ounce of debris that come out of ground zero. And we set up search and fields, we set up conveyor belts, and ultimately every, every piece of material ultimately uh, went across a conveyor belt looking again for bone fragments, for uh, a ring, something that could bring closure to families, okay? At that point, there were certainly no survivors. So it was a very difficult uh, place to be working, but again, I, I saw the teamwork and I saw the partnerships and I saw the, uh, the great efforts of all involved to, uh, to work hard to try to find uh, individuals who were lost at the time and to, uh, to start the, the long road to the recovery of the site. At that moment in time, at the start of 9-11, we were kind of a little diverging from what I saw our country to be. But 9-11, other than the horrific event that happened by a limited number of very bad people, I saw our country coming together. Every aspect that I saw while I was in New York City, it was amazing what people were doing. Even as we drove down along the Hudson River to the work site, they were handing out Gatorade, T-shirts, underwear, cigarettes, candy, regular people, and just thanking us for going there. And once you got there, what you saw, the efforts of the people that were there, the police, the firemen, the iron workers, you would see people in a line with buckets at nighttime removing debris by hand. And it just impressed me so much how strong our country was at that moment in time and how we weren't going to let nobody kick our butt. We were going to do the opposite and survive. And that's what we did. Because I had been a victim of the 93 attacks, uh, I had been uh, working a half day that day and I was walking towards the garage at lunchtime to go home when the truck bomb went off because my car had been parked there that morning. Because I had gone through that trauma and the reality of the world had changed, it was easier for me to respond quickly those first few days. And then over time, as I saw Manhattan and I saw the devastation and the loss of the towers, including the building, Tower 2, where I had started my career as an engineer years before, it started to settle in and how my children's futures were completely changed, as was everyone's at the, from going forward. Over in the trailers over at the Fresh Kills landfill, and there were buckets, you know, like a bait bucket, five gallon buckets, hundreds of buckets filled with ID cards, credit cards. Now, mind you, they were looking for human remains. They were, they were searching for everything, through everything. You couldn't find an office chair, but you could find thousands and thousands of these plastic cards that folks, and every one of those cards was attached to a person. And, and a person who had a story and a family. And to me, that was one of the more striking um, uh, sort of visual, uh, you know, objects that I, that I witnessed at that time. Like, oh my God, just the sheer magnitude of this when you got to that personal level. The other item was the walls that were created, these, these uh, missing person walls that were created on, on almost every structure that was down close to ground zero, missing you know, mother of three, 
the, a little bit of a history of the family. Um, and then people would leave, you know, little teddy bears and dolls. And so it's like things you see today when there's usually tragedy. But the scale and the magnitude of this particular disaster in that very concentrated place, and that's the key part to it, it was just in this little concentrated place the sheer magnitude of the destruction and despair and anguish for all of those families. And that made me even more serious about the job that I was doing because I felt like, again, there was a story here, there was a dimension to this, and it had to be taken just from the fact that they were terrorists, but take it back to that human dimension of the loss and the anguish for all of these families. I like to think I did a pretty darn good job about it in convincing people really what really happened here. Um, New York is a, is a tough place. I mean, let's be honest, it really is. But never in all my years being a city kid have I witnessed a, a, a city come together like what happened here. The Corps of Engineers' role, uh, our supplying of materials and manpower and folks and our ability to work across agencies and then the commitment of the city of New York and, you know, um, say what you may, um, it was a really good collection of people at the right time for the right reasons doing really God's work and I, I have to give everybody credit.